Welcome in the latest episode of that SEC podcast brought to you by Twisted T and my bookie. I'm your host, Michael Bratton. I go by SEC Mike on Twitter. And I'm joined as always by my cousin Shane, who goes by Big Orange Balls on Twitter. What's up, yo, Tennessee Hover? <laughs> I just opened a beer for those audio listeners. What's going on? <laughs> uh, I'm out of I'm out of I'm out of the Twisted tees, uh, so I switched it to. Uh, I, I got to knock out these minis out these Missouri beers, you know. <laughs> yeah, the beer. I mean, we we went overload all this uh, football season with the alcohol. You know what? Oh, I know, but it's fun, man. It's been a it's been a fun fun run, and uh, and it just seems like here at the end, it's just more and more fireworks every single day, brother. I mean, I can't stay off Twitter. I, I tried to get some work done today, and <laughs> and then I caught myself, you know, trying to just figure out where Bobby Petrino is going to land, you know. So <laughs> it's just it's it's nonstop, and that's why I, I love it because the next few weeks, yeah, especially with this, when that transfer portal window opens up. Man, you thought we had action last weekend, man. We got a lot of action about to hit the ground here. Right. A loaded show, Shane. So much going on, but um, a little show announcement. I didn't even get to this because we've been so jam-packed with Steven and, and everything else. And John Neighbors just had him on the show. Go back and check that out if you missed it. But uh, so, you know, we've already kind of touched on this a little bit, but we're not going to be at the yeah. SEC Championship. We, we tried to get down there. Not this year, they said. Maybe another year. So we're going to do our own version. We're going to do yeah. our college game day style live, leading up to the game. We're gonna we're gonna do our, you know, lead up to it. Then we're gonna watch mm-hmm. the game, obviously. And uh, if I can coax Shane into it, we're gonna do a halftime report. <laughs> I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm in. <laughs> and then as soon as the game's over, we're going live again. So we're gonna go three livers all Saturday. For the SEC Championship, first time we've ever done something like that. And, uh, man, I, I hope we can get as many people in here as we can. You know what? Oh, it's going to be exciting. That's why, again, YouTube, get on there, hit the subscribe button, and turn your notifications on because because you are correct. We're going to go live before the game. We're going to get the, uh, together at halftime. Answering, I mean, that's what I love about it is the interaction too. You know, because me and Mike, obviously, we're going to have our two sits on the on the on the narrative there. But but listen to what you guys say. Sometimes you guys take it in a different direction. So this is just as much your show as it is ours. So be sure to jump on there and then fo- finishing up the game, you're going to get probably a blistered cousin Shane and uh, <laughs> I don't know, maybe a somewhat so- uh, sober Mike. I don't know, but. <laughs> But depending on how this game goes, it should be pretty damn fun, man. Yeah. We may not get invited back. <laughs> but hey, Shane, so again, loaded show here. We got, you know, we're gonna talk Alabama, Georgia, of course, this massive showdown. Uh we got comments from the new Texas AM coach Mike Elko. Comments mm-hmm. from uh the new Mississippi State coach, Jeff Levy. Wanna give, you know, the audience a little informed of who these guys are, Bobby Petrito. So much yeah. going on, but uh, before we get into all that, Shane, great job here. Chris Lowe, ESPN, kind of uh, broke some news here. I, I was waiting to, to to cover this with you, Shane, but some notable 2024 SEC matchups that I've already announced. They're going to announce the, the full slate here in uh-huh. probably about a week's time is, is what I understand, but uh, we got some games, Shane. I'll throw it up here on the screen. Uh, these are just the ones being reported by ESPN, and again, these are all next season, but my goodness, Shane, this slate is just incredible. Right out the gate, Miami at Florida. Ooh. I mean, Billy <laughs> and, and yeah. the Miami coach, my God, they they have, this is like, this might be whoever loses might get fired uh, at the end of the season, you know what? You know, they better have the the damn Spurrier cam again, you know. <laughs> I want to know how he feels about this matchup. <laughs> and then that same day, Shane, Notre Dame at Texas yeah. A&M. Mike Elko, I guess this will be his debut as uh, A&M's yeah. head coach. He used to be defensive coordinator at Notre Dame, so there's storylines galore in that one. Cannot wait for that. And then, oh, yeah, Shane, two weeks later, again, you're going to sense a theme here, Texas A&M at Florida, 
Billy better not lose year one. <laughs> my I mean, this man is going to be on a, on a hot, hot seat here. But right out the gate, giving you Miami, and two weeks later, Texas A&M coming to the swamp. Man, they, they are yeah. not making it easy on Billy Napier here. No, it's going to be like Jimbo 2.0. It's like, is this the week? Is this the week? You know, <laughs> they got to come out. They got to come out strong. They got to, I mean, obviously got to put Miami away. Mm-hmm. And Texas A&M with a new coach, you know, there's, there's not a lot of runway here. So, again, you, can't, you cannot afford for a slow start like you've, like you've had in the past, you know. So, you really got to come out with your, your feet running. And, uh, man, that's tough. And, you're like you said, you're going to sense a theme because it, it's almost like that every week now. Now it's like, oh, well, then you got Oklahoma coming or Texas coming, you know? <laughs> right. And speaking of Oklahoma, Shay, so their first official SEC game, Tennessee at Oklahoma. Ooh. Josh Heupel's return to Norman. Uh-huh. Ooh, buddy, that this is September 21st. I mean, that this is a this feels like a playoff game. Damn, that'd be a great one to see. Like you said, just the the story, the narrative coming in there. Uh, there was rumors of Hopple when when that job opened up, mm-hmm. and I'm sure they're going to show everybody uh, him at the the Heisman, you know, the podium there. So obviously didn't win it, but was a candidate while he was a quarterback over there. Yep. So it's going to be awesome to see. And uh, you know, the last time we were there, it didn't turn out so well. So <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully, maybe Tennessee could get back on the good side there. Right, and uh, yeah. You know, there's not going to be anyone that's going to win, win this game more than Heupel. They they fired yeah. his offensive coordinator. Remember that. So, mm-hmm. the following week, Shane, my goodness, Georgia at Alabama, September 28th. <laughs> Mike, I mean, are we just holding the national championship in the first <laughs> month of the season? That, that's that's what it may feel like come September 28th. You know what? Well, you can see why all these colleges are getting paid so much by Disney, you know, because <laughs> they loaded it up. They absolutely did. And, and again, you're going to sense a theme with, with – you know, a lot on the line. And, and with the expansion of the college football playoffs, you know, th- you're not out if you lose one of those games anymore. You know what I'm saying? So, right. you know, you see in a schedule like this back in the 90s, you're like, shit, you know, <laughs> we're, there, we're done, you know. But all you got to do is win a couple of one or two of these marquee games and you're still in contention uh, at the end of the season for potential uh, college football playoffs. So, yeah, man, we're not even out of September yet, Mike. What else we got? Yeah, that, yeah, and that's a great point with the with the expanded playoff. So these are not going to be a, quite elimination games, but they're going to be uh-huh. fantastic. Two games on the October 19th slate, Shane. Alabama at Tennessee. Oh, yeah. That's a rivalry again. I mean, it's last two have been classics here. And then Georgia at Texas. Kirby Smart defense, <laughs> Steve Sarkeesian offense. The two teams that battled it out for Arch Manning going head to head. I mean, oh my goodness. And these these are just conference games, Shane. Oh man, I'm telling you that, that, and I don't even know what time they go. You know, that's the thing. Usually, you have one marquee game. That's that's the infamous 3:30 CBS. It feels like they're going. ABC is going to have their hands full on what to put at that mid midweek or uh, mid. Oh shit, what's the thing I'm trying to say? Midday uh, time slot. Right, right, and oh, that's another thing, Shane. When so when they have, they reveal the schedules here in about a week or so, yeah, it's my understanding that. They're going to give the kickoff times for most of them right out of the way. So we, it's not going to be a week-to-week, when are we playing? Is it 3.30? Is it prime time? Because ESPN, Disney owns yeah. all the rights, they can set the schedule now. And, and there's no CBS got oh, to wow. pick a game, ESPN gets to pick a game. No, they get to determine all of it. Now, I, I, I don't think they're going to announce all of them because, right. you know, how they put like, you know, let's let's be uh, let's be real here, Shane. Like uh, Missouri, Georgia this year. Yeah. That if they were doing that in December of last year, that's probably like a nooner. Yeah. But that was the game for the SEC East, so they they had to give that in in a great slot. So they're still probably going to have have the ability to flex games, I would think. But that that's going to be pretty wild to see. You know, the full slate and kickoff times uh, come December. That's a good point, Mike, and I would expect more balance 
with with ABC, ESPN. Not you know, you're not going to have three or four at one time slot. Right. You know, try to balance it out so that you can watch multiple games. You know, each round, if you will. So I I, I think this is a good move for viewership. It's a good. I think it's a good move move for a fandom, but you know, uh, Texas, you know, they're so used to playing at noon. You know, they used to do those. What it was a big noon kickoffs or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> you, you ain't playing at noon in the SEC, Texas. You nope. you made me a while before you play during the daytime. You know. <laughs> and then, how about this curveball, Shane? LSU at Texas A and M. They usually meet at the very end of the season. They're they're switching yeah. it up, October twenty sixth. So. Uh, we'll get to uh, why they're doing that in just a minute, but that's notable. LSU A&M. What, not what meeting, game was that again? Uh, LSU at A&M, October 26th, okay. so not rivalry weekend. Oh, you, yeah, we know it's coming. We know it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then November 9th, about the same time as always, Alabama at LSU. Mm -hmm. That's going to be one heck of a battle. And it'll be unique this year, Shane, because usually that's the battle for the SEC West. But there will be no SEC West next season. It's all one division. Yeah. So that, that'll be kind of unique November 9th. Uh, Texas at Arkansas November 16th. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> now, that's a matchup I want to see. You know what? Absolutely. 2.0. Yeah. <laughs> and then how about this, Shane? Right before the Iron Bowl, Papa ain't going to be happy, Shane. Alabama at Oklahoma November Oof. 23rd Norman Oklahoma that usually that's when they uh, Alabama gets a cupcake right before the Iron Bowl not this year brother this year it's it's freaking uh, Oklahoma suitors Absolutely. This is the week we hear subtle hints from Coach Saban on why they shouldn't have expanded the <laughs> SEC. <laughs> <laughs> and then last but uh, the best for the last here, Shane, and, and just just because I've missed this game so much, first time as conference SEC opponents. Texas at Texas A&M, November oh, yeah. 30th, Thanksgiving weekend, rivalry weekend, Texas at Texas A&M. Cannot wait <sighs> for that one. And that's going to be on a Saturday? Uh, the, yeah. The, uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, I wonder wonder if they flex that a little bit. No, this is this is going to be awesome. That's already my favorite week. Now we've got this one added to it, Mike. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's going to oh, be a yeah. fantastic matchup. And there's gonna, the shit talk has already started. Every time I see, and I don't know if we're going to play the clip, but there's Texas A&M was uh, kind of brought up on the news local channel down there. And, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, man, Texas just piled on. You know, it's like, <laughs> like it, it, I love it man I, I i mean we got to see little pieces of it but now that they're going to be in this conference the chirping oh my gosh i just it's just more rivalry more hate and it's just going to ramp up that last week of the year are you talking about that guy that that news ranker yeah. guy whatever who kinda, yeah okay yeah let's play that clip shane and uh i i'll give you all my take on on the other side I'm Mike Leslie, and this is my extra point. Mike Elko is the new head coach at Texas A&M, introduced Monday in College Station, a man I actually covered when I was in college, and he was the defensive coordinator at my alma mater, Hofstra University, now a decade and a half later is the man in charge at Kyle Field. I'm excited for Elko. I think he's genuinely a very good hire for A&M, and I think he's the type of grounded, substantive hire that A&M needed after years of more flash than anything else. But Elko, in his press conference on Monday, said something that just doesn't compute for me. He talked about how A&M is going to fulfill their potential as the premier football program in the country. And he said that the best version of Texas A&M wins national championships. And I just want to ask, based on what? Texas A&M, their fans, their boosters, Aggies believe their program should be among the elite in college football. Why? They won 11 games in 2012. Johnny Manziel won the Heisman. It was a banner year for the program. Prior to that, you have to go back to 1998 to find another double-digit win season. Texas A&M has two double-digit win seasons since I was eight years old. The Kansas Jayhawks have stumbled their way into just as many. I'm happy for Elko, and I hope for his sake he has success in College Station. I think he has a real chance. But the idea that A&M should be a premier program in the country, it takes more than money to build that. The Aggies are proof. Maybe Mike Elko is finally the missing link. All right, Shane. So, I mean, I, you hear this all the time. 
A and M's not won in hundred years or something like that. They they don't uh-huh. they don't they you know they've not won an SEC title. I don't know. I didn't follow them when they're Big Twelve. I'll be honest with you. But I you know it's not. I don't think they very rarely won Big Twelve title. So I get it. the The recent history is not there. But what matters more than anything else is talent in college football. Yeah. And A and M has not top fifteen talent. Not Mm -hmm. top 10 talent. They have top five talent, Shane. And that is an indictment on Jimbo Fisher and why we've been saying he's garbage, he's awful for years. He's been holding them back. And even, I mean, it's night and day different when they fired him. You know, the offense come to life with a third-string quarterback. I mean, they were going toe-to-toe with the likely Heisman winner on the road uh, just last Saturday. I mean – the team was elevated, and they didn't even freaking yeah. have a head coach. You know what I mean? So that that's the biggest reason why. And my other argument, Shane, is, and I, I get it, it's not quite apples to apples, but Georgia didn't win a national championship for 41 years. That yeah. has not held them back in any regard, as right now they're the, they're the best team in college football. So I, I don't care if the streak's 41 years. I don't care if the streak's 141 years. That has no bearing on what these – players are going to do moving forward no i mean that's that's what it boils down to it's it's just an eye test you know you know the talents down there we have composite rankings of uh you know different recruiting outfits we know the talent that's in texas we know the talent that has landed in college station and that's why you know i I think it's so dumb sometimes to to look at these numbers and say well you haven't won a a natty in what 80 100 years you know whatever (laughs) but think about it you know uh, there was a time when Nebraska was the powerhouse. There was a time when Minnesota was a powerhouse. There was a time when Georgia Tech was a powerhouse. You know, it's like these – it's ebbs and flows, and, and it comes and goes. And, and it, you know when one team's closer to, to popping than one team's, you know, closer to disappearing. And, and Texas A&M has been on that fringe of, of, of making that next step, just like Georgia did, you know, how many 10-win seasons. That's, that's the reason Mark Rick got fired, man, is because – because they knew that that was a national championship opportunity and it wasn't getting to that level. So they finally got a coach and look, all of a sudden we're talking about one of the longest streaks to ever happen in college football. So I, I, Texas a and is right there. Texas is right there. You know, it's just, it takes, it takes a perfect alignment, but it also takes a, an opportunity. And I think college, especially down there at college station, they have that opportunity. That's why we've been so high on them the last couple of seasons. Yep. Well, we'll get to Mike Elko's introduction here in just a minute, Shane, but uh, huge news out of the SEC on Tuesday. Bobby Petrino riding that (laughs) hall down to Fayetteville. I mean, oh my goodness, Shane. Never in a million years did I think uh, Bobby Petrino would be back at Arkansas. And the only uh, hiccup, I I don't think it's officially been announced just yet. I could be wrong as we're recording it. It probably will be official by the time this podcast airs. But uh, how crazy is this, Shane? I think the the only hiccup, they they don't call it the Bobby Petrino policy, but that's basically what it is. Mm-hmm. They have a uh, policy in place. If you've been fired for cause at the University of Arkansas, you cannot be rehired there. Does that make sense? No, I didn't know that. They have that? They yeah they did it right after they fired Bobby Petrino they yeah. put this policy okay. in yeah so they're arguing now well when we fired him that was not in place so he, so he is uh, <laughs> not <laughs> under that <laughs> policy oh my god <laughs> but it, it's just so funny that they're having to do like a little uh yeah you know roundabout here just to just kind of skirt the rules but uh you know be that as it may all the jokes that are being made I get it. But uh, I think, you know, this is a move that will endear Sam Pittman to this fan base that has yeah. essentially turned on him. Uh, but we, we all know Bobby Petrino, the history, just an elite offensive line. I would argue that Texas A&M was night and day different on the offensive mm-hmm. side of the football this year. It was working well. Connor Wigman gets hurt. And now with a more athletic quarterback in Jalen Henderson – You really got to see what this offense was capable of in College Station. Uh, I think for Sam Pittman, who's back against the wall, 
again, that was another thing. People were saying, well, how good of a candidate can a guy like that really attract if, it, if he's kind of a, a, you know, a, a season away from being fired, which is a fair yeah. question. All things considered, Shane, I don't know. I don't think they could have done any better than Bobby Petrino. No, man. I mean, there's part of you is like, you know, Sam's don't let the fox in the hen house kind of thing, you know. But, <laughs> but I, I mean, he, he had a short list of candidates that fit the problem that he's had. I mean, that's one thing we talked about, Coach Odom especially being there. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody that has the experience of being a head coach. Some of the – you know, you've heard Sam say, hey, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what was the right decision here. Now you got you got a guy here that's got plenty of head coaching experience, somebody he can lean on again. And, you know, those that win together, you know, flourish. I mean, look at Coach Odom. When things were going good, he was able to go get another job somewhere else. I, I think – Bobby Petrino, this is an opportunity for a stepping stone. But if you are Bobby, you know, this is a place you want to come back to, and you're you're looking at an an opportunity. I think it's a win-win for him, too. You know, there's not a lot – this was a very, very short list. And the fact that you convinced Bobby Petrino to come back here, I think this is a home run hire, man. And, and I think it's a home run because if it doesn't work out, you got a, you got a fail safe. you got a backup plan here that could, that could step in and, and win immediately. Bobby Petrino's done it there, you know. So, right. yeah, this is a very, very intriguing hire. The, the Little Rock Touchdown Club, I can't wait to get to <laughs> one of those and, uh, and, and ask a few questions, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let me ask you this uh is, is there anyone that comes to mind shane that has been let go fired you know what have you that you th- that you said man that guy will never be be welcome back because i mean that's that's essentially what we got here and I, i'm just talking you know fantasy land here but i'm thinking yeah. like coach o the next lsu defensive line coach like i'd love something yeah. like that um, any of these guys, mm. a- any anything pop into your head that, uh, you know, maybe uh, Nick Saban, LSU head coach, <laughs> I mean, they, you know what I mean? Like, there, there's a yeah. lot. Of course, he was not dis- dismissed or anything. He, he left on his own accord, but... Uh, can you think of any that would be almost as funny as Bobby Petrino well, there, back? There was a couple that was close. You know, the when Tennessee had that opening spot, Lane Kiffin name <laughs> was floating around out there quite often, and and there was quite a bit of trolling. So I I, I think. There were some camps that would have accepted that and some that were like, hell no, that's not going to happen. So that would be one. Um, oh, I, you just, know, I just thought of a good one. Yeah. South Carolina, they're unhappy with their defensive coordinator. Bring back <laughs> Will Muschamp as our defensive <laughs> coordinator. <laughs> that would be perfect. That would be perfect. Or Spurrier for off, you know, offense or something, you know. Yeah, because there's a lot of people – you know, that got fired just because of performance, but there was some that kind of burnt some bridges on their way out. So that's right. the ones I'm thinking of, you know, Bobby, even, well, look at Hugh Freeze just in the SEC period, <laughs> I think is a, is some sort of success story, I would imagine. So, uh, yeah, no, there's a few dudes floating around. Derek Dooley, yeah. <laughs> Derek Dooley back in Missouri, you know, helping them out with the OC. <laughs> well, yeah, but there's – uh. Man, this this is just a league that believes in second chances. I believe in second chances. I don't know about you, Shane. Oh, well, we wouldn't be here, Mike, if we weren't for <laughs> second chances. <laughs> well, speaking of second chances, Shane, that's what Mike Elko is doing down there in College Station. Back first time, obviously, as head coach, but very, very, very successful defensive coach for them Aggies for several seasons, four seasons of uh, outstanding defense down there in College Station. But the big question, Shane, what will the offense look like under Mike Elko, the defensive, uh, f- former defensive coordinator? Here's Mike Elko and what he plans to, to bring on the offensive side of the ball. Yeah. Chronicle, we've seen what you can do on defense here. What are your plans for the offense? Yeah, I mean, obviously, everybody, that's the million-dollar question. And, and, and what I tell people this, uh, we are going to find a way to play explosive offense. Uh, we're going to be uh, part of the modern era. Uh, we're going to be able to switch up tempos. We're going to be able to utilize our personnel. Uh, I think in this day and age, you've got to be able to be very multiple and very adaptable uh, in what you do on offense. I think people get caught up uh, in these words like they mean everything, like, oh, we got to be spread or we got to be pro-style. And at the end of the day, we've got to 
to be a group that knows how to attack defenses, get the ball in our playmakers' hands, and allow them to be successful. Now, this was interesting, Shane, because some, there was some speculation, you know, should they keep Bobby Petrino? Would have been a good yeah. hire, but obviously that's not going to happen now. So uh, uh, I, I think it's the right answer. You, you don't want to pigeonhole yourself into any one system or anything like that, but it, it, this is going to be the pivotal hire for Mike Elko to, to land a, uh, an elite offensive coach to run it. And, and from what I understand, Shane, they're giving $11 million for the assistance for Mike Elko. Oh, wow. So, uh, I mean, price should not, a uh, price tag's not going to be a problem. You know what? No, not at all. No, they're going to, they're going to be able to write a check, pretty nice check for somebody here. And, and I think that's important, Mike, because, you know, a lot of times head coaches, they, they make the mistake of, of restructuring everything. You know, I, I, I Prime example was Arkansas this year, you know, or uh, Mississippi State. I apologize. You know, they had a system that that was working, and then you try to retool the offense in one off season. It, it you can't do that. I think this first OC needs to look at what do we got in the cabinet, what do we got to work with, what have we been recruiting with for the last three to four years, and then that's that's the type of offense that we need to have out here. So we hit the ground running. So, but it is an important, very, very important hire here. Elko, we have no doubt that this defense is going to be singing right along, you know, but this offense is going to be the biggest question mark coming into this season. And so it's, it's pivotal that he hires the right guy. Right. And one other, uh, well, the two clips put together, Shane, why Elko, why he's the man for the job. And really, I, I really wanted to play this one, Shane. His first team meeting, it was uh, a reunion of sorts with a lot of the players, a lot of the coaching mm -hmm. staff. And uh, I want to ask you about this on the other side. And real quick, too, on that last, I just, I think that's what the fans want to hear. You know, they don't want to hear some boring ass offense is going to roll in town either. You know, right. they're going to keep up with the times and they're going to be aggressive. They're going to be fast and they're going to be play loose. And you're not going to be conservative, which I think is what frustrated a lot of Aggie fans to begin with. Mm -hmm. Christy Regan from the Associated Press. You said earlier to the fans that um, you're tired of talking about winning a national championship. It's time to be about it. But just to talk about it a little bit more, um, <laughs> what what? Gives you confidence that you'll be able to bring the Aggies their first national championship since the 1930s. Yeah, I, I just think when you look at what this program is capable of, what we've got to do is we've got to fulfill that potential. And I think that happens with work. And, and I think that was the message I sent to the players. That was the message I tried to deliver to the crowd. Um, we can't just say we want to be something. We can't just say we want to arrive somewhere. We've got to be committed to all the work that it's going to take from today until we kick off next September of doing that. And, and there's a lot that goes into that. There's culture building. There's camaraderie. There's connecting with the players. There's the players connecting at a greater level with each other. Uh, there's strength and conditioning. There's development. You know, there's so much that goes into winning football games in the fall. And um, those are the things that we've got to start taking pride in. You know, it's, it's easy to take pride in making big plays on Saturday in front of 110,000 people. Uh, are we willing to do the things that we need to do when no one's looking so that we can have the results that we want come the fall? Only being gone two years, you probably had relationships with some of these guys. You either coached or recruited. Uh, you know, what was kind of your message to them and their response? And could, did you maybe get to speak a little differently having those prior relationships instead of coming into a room maybe a little cold? Yeah, you know, it was it was probably a unique start to a first team meeting. You know, there's not many times when you go into a first team meeting and, and 50 of the players come up and give you a big hug and welcome you back, right? And, and so I think the start was really unique. It was great to see a lot of those kids, uh, some of those kids that I have coached, uh, some of those kids that I kind of watched on the other side of the ball, some of those kids that were part of the evaluation process and the recruiting process but didn't actually get to see uh, arrive on campus. And so um, that part was really good. But then I think when you get up in front of them, um, all of that has to go away, right, because it's about new leadership. It's about new direction. It's about establishing a new identity. And, and so you just start building the roadblocks for what that looks like. And so so uh, as much as there is this continuity of guys that you've known and, and you uh, have related to over the years, you know, there's still a job that needs to be done and building it to the level that needs to get to. And you got to make sure you don't cut any corners. Uh, now, Shane, on, on these these clips, though, uh, this is something I talked to Stephen about yesterday. And I'm kind of uh -huh. curious to get your thoughts. Again, 
you, I think it'd be a, a huge mistake to hire a coach because he, you know, he's been there before and he knows the players. That, that's not the reason you're hiring the guy, but I do think it's a, a big added bonus with Mike Elko. And, and I, and, you know, make no mistake, I'm saying he's qualified and all that, but expectations are high. And based on what he did year one at Duke, they went from three wins to nine wins in his first year. He has shown that he can have instant impact. Maybe, you know, it's going to be difficult to have that kind of instant impact at A&M, but the fact that he knows a lot of the personnel, he's been there before, to me, suits A&M well for them to have a, a big takeoff right away. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, and expectations, you know. I mean, he's not rolling into a program. He doesn't know how the things – Yeah, it, sometimes – and, and I, who was it? I think it was Coach O that said this, you know. Yeah. He was. He knows the the schematic side of of the football games, you know. But he, you know, one thing you don't know about is the boosters. You know, you're talking about a huge part of this this future of college football. It's with the NILs, and you know, this is a guy that's been down there, recruited with these guys, shook a lot of hands, kissed a lot of babies. He knows exactly what to, what is expected down there in College Station. So I think that's part of it. You know, a big part of uh, you know. So you're not you don't have that learning learning curve that a lot of these new coaches would have at a at a new university but but one of the best parts is also the relationship with the coaches you know he's been recruiting in Texas for many many years that's where a lot of these recruits are going to come out of he's been in Louisiana I mean you know what I'm saying these established pipelines that he was down there three years and that's why I, I think when this transfer portal window opens up you're you're going to see some Aggies leave but you're going to see a lot of athletes coming in because he's already got some of those established relationships mm-hmm Take a break from the show to remind you guys we're brought to you by MyBookie. Head on over to MyBookie.ag today, the online sports book, and put in that promo code that S E C T H A T S E C over at MyBookie.ag today. They're willing to give you a two hundred dollar cash bonus exclusive to our audience. Here, this is the number one way to help the podcast stay independent. This football season, there's bowl games coming up. There's NFL, NFL playoffs, college football playoffs. Head on over to mybookie.ag today. Sign up for a new account. Throw in 50 bucks. That's all you got. They'll give you a $200 cash bonus over at mybookie.ag today. Would really, really, really help us out. And now back to the show. Now on the flip side, Shane, Jeff Lebby, new Mississippi State head coach, doesn't have those relationships in Starkville, but he he has uh, had him in Oxford when he was uh, Ole Miss offensive coordinator for two seasons under Lane Kiffin. But uh, I, I thought, uh, you know, the biggest question and the biggest reservation I have, and I, I think, you know, it's only fair to, to point out, obviously he's never been a head coach, and the challenges that come with that, particularly in the SEC, particularly in Starkville, it has been done. It, you know, Dan Mullen is, is the obvious uh, case to point to, but how can Jeff Levy get there? Let's kick it over to him on his first time as a head coach. Um, you know, you've had a lot of success on the offensive side of the ball, especially these last uh, five years, but, you know, this is your first head coaching kind of opportunity. What makes you kind of confident that, you know, you thrive in a role like this, and how are you kind of planning on adapting to a role like this? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, and I actually mentioned this outside, but it's not just about me. It's about the people that we bring in the building. We've got incredible leadership of people that I can lean on as we move through this thing to be able to go put together an, an elite staff. Uh, and I do plan on putting together a staff that has uh, incredible experience and, and knows exactly what it's supposed to look like in all three phases. And when we're going to be able to get the right people in the building is – um, you know, the timeline standpoint will be a little different depending on how a, a couple of things shake out, but but very, very confident in the people that are going to be here and, and obviously very confident in, in my approach and leadership ability to to get these guys to go where we want them to go. And I, I don't know if you caught any of this, Shay, but this this was pretty wild about, uh, you know, when he, when he came into the airport, I mean, there was like hundreds of people yeah, waiting for I him. I saw it. And uh-huh. then when they when they introduced him a day later, they it's like they had a rock concert out there for him. Yeah. And I mean the energy, the excitement, that's what I want to see. It, it's it it does seem, you know, no offense to Zach Arnett, but it, it seems like a 180. We went from 
<laughs> Zach Ardett to uh, Jeff Levy is just, you could not get more different than that. You know what? Well, you know, it's funny. It's like I can remember a handful of coaches coming in for the first time. One was Mike Leach coming off the plane mm -hmm. with a whole bunch of people. And the other one was Levy coming in with a whole bunch of people, maybe even more. You know what I'm saying? And and I I love that because, again, this was what the fans wanted. They're so excited, Mike. Mississippi State fans are so excited to go from Zach Arnett, you know, fighting for dear life to get seven points in a football game to Levy, you know, averaging over 40 points a game. I mean, you know what I'm saying? And, 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 and he mimics that. You're, you're going to hear these clips. And one word that stands out to me the most, Mike, F U. In. They're going to have some fun over there for for once. So I, I love this, man. I, I I couldn't be more happy for Mississippi State fans. Right. And, you know, he hit on a key thing here, obviously. Day one, whether you're at Ole Miss or Mississippi State, they're going to ask you about the Egg Bowl and thoughts yeah. on that. And uh, he, he made it clear, hey, he's going to be calling the plays and why that's important to him. No surprise, given that, uh, you know, he's an offensive mind. That's what he's been doing. But – I uh, wanted to ask you about that on the other side. Mississippi, you made your name as, as a play caller uh, throughout the years. Are, are you planning to continue calling plays here at Mississippi State, or do you think you'll turn that over to an offensive coordinator? No, I, I will continue to call it. Uh, I think that's important for me as we get started in this thing, having one voice as, as we move forward, um, as we're putting together the staff, still having the ability to, to hire an offensive coordinator uh, from a title standpoint to, to be able to take some of the day-to-day um, and, and be able to go have uh, total control of some of the organizational things that go on with uh, whether it be practice or game planning so that I do have the ability to be a head coach. So uh, he'll be an incredible extension of me, one that I trust, one that understands the system and, and has lived in it. You never know sure. who you're going to end up working for in this profession, but uh, you've been on the opposite sideline of a pretty important ball game around here. What, you know, what's it like maybe coaching against Mississippi State and now you're the coach at Mississippi State. Yeah, well, obviously I, I'm looking forward to, to continuing in, in the chair that I'm in. Uh, I do. I know the importance of that game after living it uh, for, for two years. Uh, but incredibly excited. Uh, I understand how prideful State is. I love the fact that our fan base um, wants that game is, you know, more, more than any one of them. And, you know, I think you can tell how passionate Dr. Keenum is when he talks about being state champs. So, again, sitting in this chair, I don't take it lightly. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. People in this state are going to have a lot of fun with that game, and I'm one of them. All right, Chase. So, again, first time head coach, calling the plays, mm -hmm. and we've seen mixed results. I mean, you could look at like Josh Heupel calls the plays; they they do fantastic. Yeah. Billy Napier. Of course, the offense is starting to pick up, but there's there's a big concern. Should he be doing that? We saw Drink give up the play calling, and Mizzou took off. Jimbo, obviously, uh, <laughs> that was taken away from him, and they kind of took off. So, I don't know. It, this this is, feels like a weird place. Thoughts on Jeff Levy calling the play? Should he do that? That's what he's. That's his strength. That's what he knows. Or should he give that up? Given all the, the new responsibilities that come with being a head coach in the SEC. Are you asking my opinion on this? Yes, sir. Because I, I think that, you know, when you're removed from that OC role, I, I think it's important that you – I mean, that's why that's why you got hired. So I, I, I believe that he should hang on to it a little bit more. Maybe not 100%, but like 80%, you know, and, and slowly – start releasing the range. You know, you saw a little bit with this with Hugh Freeze this year. You've seen it with some of these other coaches, you know. Start the season. This is what I want. These are the expectations. These are the scenarios. These are the plays I'm going to call. And then once you kind of comb the guy that's – because that's all it is is a mouthpiece. This OC, whoever he hires is going to be a mouthpiece. He's going to be somebody that can sit and film study. And, you know, so when he does start doing more of the GM work, mm -hmm. he'll – you know, he'll have somebody in those those rooms, you know, uh, getting these boys in the right spot. But right. I, I think that's important for this is just to kind of establish the culture you want, you know, establish what the expectations are, and then slowly start releasing off of that. I don't, I don't think you come in 
in and say, okay, I'm hired the head coach. I'm not going to mess with that anymore. I want this guy. Because you're putting a lot of pressure on somebody that may not have done it for or may not have the same ideas that you do. Right. And then last, I just had to play this one, Shane, because you, Lane Kiffin – Trolling away, even trolling about Jeff Levy. I don't know if you've seen it. I'll, I'll throw up the, uh, if, if anybody's missed it, the, the graph here. But uh, he was asked about it, and uh, I love this response from Jeff Levy. Jeff, uh, I don't know if you've seen the tweets that uh, Lane Kiffin has sent your way, whether it was the quote tweet of, um, you know, the Photoshop head on, on his Photoshop head on someone carrying your Photoshop head like the father's son or him tweeting at you uh, another way. But, uh, you know, getting the Egg Bowl rivalry and, and kind of hatred started early. I don't know if you've seen that, if you had any thoughts on that and what you kind of thought of uh, working with Blaine and seeing him now on the other side of that rivalry. I've seen it through um, text messages. I haven't actually seen it on Twitter. Believe it or not, I'm not incredibly surprised. <laughs> um, and I got a feeling it's not going to be the last. <laughs> so, again, this is going to be fun. That one is going to be a lot of fun. And um, – I just I can't I can't wait to get to work with our guys, create vision for them, uh, be able to cre create uh, man some steadiness and, and just talked about it. But these guys have been through a lot, and so being able to give them man a calm hand is going to be a lot of fun for for us as a staff and and these guys understanding that man they can come to us at any point in time and and be able to share their experiences and understand that. Again, we've got their back. We're here for them, and we're we're ready to go chase it together. Yeah. So, hey, uh, perfect response <laughs> here by Levy, and, and I'll let you, you know, in on on the inside here, Shane. I mean, you think you know these guys work together, they're buddies, but I hear it's the exact opposite. They don't like each other. And, and Kiffin fired his best friend, used to be the offensive line coach at Ole Miss, and mm -hmm. his name's Randy Clements, and fired his ass, and that was kind of the beginning of the end of this relationship. And, and why Levy left for Oklahoma, or at least part of it. So I like that there's juice here, and I like that Levy didn't quite take the bait. You know, I mean, it's – Yeah. Uh, I think it, that, that was a smart move. Yeah, but I love it, man. Like you said, it didn't feel like – I mean, it felt like these teams did not like each other, but it never felt like, you know – Lane Kiffin didn't like Arnett, even though they didn't even get to play in this thing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right, it, just, yeah. it, it just didn't feel like that was, was the case, you know. And, in fact, you know, short of the four-wheeler coming out there, that was about <laughs> all the coaching <laughs> excitement we had, you know. <laughs> so so I, I think this year it's going to add a little bit of something because these guys do have that relationship. There will be some trolling leading up to it. And then I think, you know, I saw an interesting uh, uh, graphic. I think they were up over 2 million views on this thing, up s several percent from last year. You know, this. so this, this is a game that is gaining viewership each season, and I think this is just going to add to it. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's uh, transition to the SEC championship game, or really what we should call it, the national championship game, yeah. Saturday in Atlanta. And uh, I don't know if you've seen this yet, Shay, but it, the line has, has shifted. It, it opened Georgia minus four. It's mm -hmm. now Georgia minus six. So nearly yep. a touchdown favorite here. Uh, so thought, I put a lot of money on it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> thoughts, on, thoughts on that, Shane? I mean, nearly a touchdown underdog for uh, the greatest coach of all time coming off of improbable win. They feel Alabama feels like the team of destiny. Georgia. Yeah. Feels like, uh, you know, they should be the favorite. I get it, betting favorite anyway, and uh, two-time national champion undefeated. But uh, does, does that change anything? Because you, you know that's plastered all over the facility down there in Alabama. Yeah, well, and so is six points, you know. Don't think Kirby Smart ain't going to his boys and say, hey, look how many games we've won, and they only think we can beat they, – they don't think we can beat them by more than a touchdown. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you, you mean that – so they're going back and forth. They're using this. This is this is beautiful rat poison for both of them. So <laughs> uh, I, I think this is great. And, and, and to be honest with you, Mike, here, you know, how many times have we – it feels a little bit different. You know, because Alabama's never really been an underdog, have they? Have they been an underdog in any game this year? Not this year, and, and very, very, very rarely. I, I think like three times under Nick Saban yeah. outside the first season. So, I mean, that's that's an intriguing part of it, too. And, I, and this is the closest that Georgia has been, you know, 
predicted to win. Now, we've all played the game like, well, if the stars are aligned, you know, you could take Georgia. So, you know what I'm saying? So, I, I think that's kind of – it's it's uncharted territory. This is the two – these are the two teams that, that we can't wait to see play because – you know, it's almost like a coin toss for some. So I, I don't know, man. I, I cannot wait. This and this I, expect this line to keep moving. I, I really do think that there's going to be some some very heavy bets put in on this one for one team or the other. Mm-hmm. And, and so let's kick it over to Kirby first, Shane, where he talks about Alabama's defense, and you know, it's almost like he steals a line from Spurrier here how hard it is to win the SEC. He doesn't quite say it's harder to win the SEC than a national championship, but I think he wants to say it. He just don't want to dis- he don't want to give any uh-huh. fuel to Michigan or whoever the hell that they yeah. destroy in the playoffs. So let's kick it over to Kirby on, on just the importance of winning an SEC title. About Alabama's defense, and are there characteristics with this defense that you're used to seeing with a Kevin Steele defense? Yeah, I mean, size, uh, speed, toughness, aggressiveness, uh, multiple coverages, uh, players that can play multiple positions. Um, the depth across the defensive line is 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 one of the things that pops out at you. They, they, they roll guys, and they constantly have fresh guys in there striking, uh, playing blocks, playing with great toughness. Um, <clears throat> really good at the star position, very experienced. Uh, got two corners that are going to be drafted that are good players, uh, playing with great safeties. I mean, they, they've, they've got an all-around really good defense, but that's what you would expect. I mean, you'd expect nothing less from, from this group. Coach, you guys have won as many SEC championships as you have national championships. Just how hard is it to win these games, and does it make you appreciate it even more? Yeah, I have a great appreciation for this game because, you know, I grew up an SEC kid, an SEC footprint kid, an SEC player. Uh, I've coached most of my career in the SEC, so I have an appreciation for this game and uh, how hard it is to win. I mean, um, it, it was no different my experience in Alabama. You know, we had a year that we won an national championship that we didn't win an SEC championship. So, um, you know, that's happened uh, a couple times in our conference. It's hard to find that in most conferences. I think it speaks to the depth uh, of our conference. It speaks to the, uh, the, the how hard it is just to get to the game. I mean, uh, we in, in some ways, I think Alabama and us have been spoiled, and I don't think – some kids appreciate, they think it's a rite of passage, and it's not. It's earned. And uh, it's, it's some of the greatest uh, venues, the uh, environments that, that, that uh, I've been a part of to play in that game. All right, Shane. So, <laughs> I, I, again, there was, uh, you know, there's been years where Georgia didn't even win the SEC, but they won the national championship to start this incredible run they're on. So, uh, and it was, of course, Alabama that ruined it for him. So yeah, uh, th- there's a lot of truth to what he's saying. But let me let me ask you this, Shay: do, do you think this game will be tougher for Georgia than any game they're going to face potentially in the playoff? Yeah, now, name another team that that Georgia should be scared of that potentially is in their way on their you know going toward a national championship. You know, I think mm-hmm. a lot of people are going to point at the Michigans and the Wash, whatever. You know, I mean, they're going to be a fun story, but they're also going to be a black mark on the on the street. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? <laughs> Georgia's going to run through everybody. This is the only team that, you know, I, I'm not saying it's had your number, but, you know, in Atlanta, it's been a little bit different situation. So, um, and there's a little bit of that going on. So, I don't know, man. I don't know. I, I just, I, I keep going back and forth. I just want to say, well, yeah, Georgia's going to beat the hell out of them. And then, right. and then I'm like, well, I don't know, man. Nick Saban, he made that deal with the devil. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he, they may come out and, and whoop Georgia again in Atlanta. Yeah. I, you know, as you were saying, well, Michigan, Washington, all the, they're just TCU with different jerseys on, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's it. It'll be fun to talk about, you know? <laughs> and then last one from Kirby. I love this shade. He's asked about Jayla Milrow. He said, yeah, reminds me of my son. He plays, he loves to play Madden and, and he's always the Ravens. I said, why, why are you the Ravens? Because they got Lamar Jackson. That's why. So <laughs> that's what he sees in Jayla Milrow. Kirby, a lot of history and tradition about this game. I think that's why so many people love it. So I'm going to ask you to maybe reflect if you can remember a long time ago. 
2009, I think Chuck Dunlap told us that this is only the second time two teams have met undefeated in the league in the game. You were the defensive coordinator for Nick Saban, and I think you took down Florida. I think that led to a national title, your first one as an assistant. Can you reflect on that? And then, two, when you were talking about Milrow, are those like Tim Tebow characteristics with the size, the speed, and the running ability? No offense to Tim Tebow, but he's he's th- th- this guy's different. You know, Tim was, uh, you know, I mean, he was just it was a different different running style. You know, very different running style in terms of uh, what they did and, and how they did things. Um, this guy's, I mean, it's like when I was when I used to ask my, my sons who they were playing with on the Madden game, and they would say, "I'm playing with the Ravens," and I would say, "Why are you playing with the Ravens?" And they would say, "I got, they got Lamar Jackson, and nobody can tackle him." Well, this guy's a, a bigger physical version of, of that. He's playing in a different speed uh, than everybody else when you watch it. And that's the way the Madden game was for him. And, uh, you know, people – the guy throws the ball really well. So the comparison to 2009, I don't know if you're trying to compare that to that or you're just saying, do we remember the game? Yeah, I remember the game. It was a, a game for us that, that we had lost the previous year and felt like we were really close to winning and felt like we were going to have to get over that hurdle. They were the dominant team uh, in the country, I guess, at that time, and they had uh, some really good football players and had a really good coaching staff. Uh, and we played a good game that game, and uh, the players all played and believed in themselves, and it was a, it was a tremendous uh, venue and game, sure. All right, Shay Dove. Well, I, I know you're a big Madden guy. Who, yeah. Do, do you play with the Ravens, or who, who's your team? Because yeah, I – I know your brother. All he does is run around. You know, I'm sure yeah. all he does is play with the Ravens. But uh, back in the day, back in the day, I, I was I leaned heavy, but especially on mobile quarterbacks. But these <laughs> days, brother, they got so many different. These little kids, they can blitz and everything. You know, I, I was playing my nephew the other day. He smoked me, by the way, and uh, <laughs> I couldn't I couldn't get out of the pocket. So no, I'd rather have a I'd rather have an accurate court. Not saying that Lamar's not, but you know, on that game, I, I I'd take a give me a Joey Burrow or something like that. You know, somebody just just dialed in, throwing dimes out there. And I, I'm more worried. about about the athletes that are around me, I need receivers, you know. So right. and, uh, and and going back to what he's talking about here, you know, um, I, I'm sure Tim Tebow took that a little personal, you know. What I'm <laughs> I, mean, and, and, I mean, in a nice way, he was talking about Tim not being as good as Jalen, you know. Right. Of course, Tim would have ran through you, you know. So hey, let me ask you this then on on Jalen Milrow, because G- Georgia has been. Um, you know, giving up some yardage to quarterbacks that can run. Yeah. Would you be more concerned about Jalen Milrow running in this football game? Or, you know, I would argue he's got the best deep ball in the SEC. If he if he has time to hit George over the top, what, uh, which, what do you think Georgia should be more concerned about when it comes strictly to Jalen Milrow in this matchup on Saturday? I think it's legs. Um, you know, because one one game I go back to is the Auburn game, yeah. And uh, you know, Thorne had a hell. Of, I mean, he he just had a parade back there, and and I think that's what's kind of standing out in my mind, and that is going to have to be the equalizer. Is, is Milrow just? sacrificing himself you know he's going to have to be able to pull it down and run and uh you know the opportunities will come down the field but you know that secondary is loaded that defense is loaded uh you know it's easier said than done <laughs> you know but uh i really do think that it's going to come down to the mobility uh, of Jalen here mm-hmm. now on the other side shane we got nick saban talking up oh man the greatest oh. offense ever assembled over yeah. there in athens Here's old Papa talking about uh, Carson and Brock Bowers and Lad McConkey. And my goodness, are they dynamic? Are they unstoppable? Let's kick it over to Nick Saban. Just preparing for a guy like Brock Bowers, and then do you just kind of, Kirby said yesterday's status is kind of day to day. Do you just prepare as if he's going to play? I'm sorry. Brock Bowers for Georgia. Yeah. Well, um, you know, Georgia's got a really, really good offensive team. And a quarterback obviously does a fantastic job of whether they're running the ball, carrying out fakes, play action passes, drop back passes. I mean, he is very efficient and effective in everything that he does. He's very accurate with the ball. He's smart, throws at the right place. So he does a great job of implementation of exactly what they want to do. And they have a really, really good scheme. 
And obviously, Brock Bowers is, you know, is a really, really good player, uh, probably the best player at his position in the country. And, you know, I'm assuming that he will play in the game. I don't know any different than that. Uh, and he's a mismatch issue, uh, but he's also a good blocker and a really good competitor. So it's not only his pass catching ability, uh, it's his ability to do all the things that really good football players do, uh, and he does them at all at a high level. A uh, question about Georgia's passing game. So Ladd McConkey, of course, missed September with a back injury. Took him a couple weeks after that, I think, before he was in peak form. And that's right when they lost Bowers to the ankle injury. So they've only had those guys healthy together for like two, three games. How much more dynamic is Georgia with both of those guys healthy? Well, both those guys are really good players. So obviously they're very dynamic. But I will say this, that the players who have played for those guys, because and this speaks to the depth of you know, Georgia's team, you know, four is a really good tight end uh, and has done a really, really good job. Um, one, 86, five, the other receivers that have played, you know, they've always done, they, they've done a really good job and they're really, really good players. So um, those two guys are fantastic players in their own right and they're very productive. And, but the players who have stepped up and taken their place have done a really, really good job as well. All right, so this ba this had me thinking here, Shane. We've seen Jaden Daniels against his Alabama defense, uh -huh. and he kind of had his way for the first half. We've even seen Tennessee kind of, I don't want to say have their way because they didn't they didn't convert in the red zone, but they they you know won the first half. A mm -hmm. um, and M had had a nice well kind of a decent performance, but point being, Shane, Alabama. There, there's some truth to what Saban's saying here. Georgia's offense is a, is another level, and it's it's just aside from Brock Bowers, I don't, and maybe Carson Beck. I'm not ready to put Carson Beck in this category, but it's it's not necessarily because they've got, you know, the best running back, the best quarterback, the best receivers. They've got very, very, very good, all of that. And tight end. I mean, yeah. the the one thing they have all world is is obviously Brock Bowers at tight end. Right. But they just have so many different weapons they can hit you with that that makes them dangerous. And Carson yeah. Beck is so accurate and he's got the big arm. But my concern for Alabama in this one, Shane, is they've been able to have adjustments and dominate the second half against a lot of good teams. But if they get down 10 – 14, 17, 20 points to Georgia. I don't think they're going to be able to completely shut them down in the second half to make a comeback. Do you, uh, what, what's your thoughts on that? I mean, do they have to keep it within range here in the first half? Yeah, I think they do, Mike. And, and you know, one of the things I think you hit the nail on the head was Alabama has shown, especially here at the tail end of the season, how, how successful they could be on halftime adjustments. Right. But you know which team is doing better job at that? The one they're playing. So even if you are down, let's say, 17 points, it's not like you can just fix it because they're going to have their adjustments too and they're going to be prepared. Georgia's going to be just as prepared. So I think this, for Alabama to win this game, they've got to keep it closer. they got to get ahead, obviously. So I, I think that's going to what it, what it boils down. They cannot afford to get down multiple scores because if that happens, Georgia can play keep away and they'll keep those chains moving and they'll still find ways to put points on the board. He'll come out with that same recipe. Hey, we just need four drives. If we can get three scores <laughs> off four drives, we're going to win this damn game. You <laughs> know? <laughs> so uh, I, I think this it, this is going to be a just a heavyweight fight, man. That's what that's the way it should be dubbed. I'll make a prediction right now, Shane. If Alabama is down by seven or less at halftime of the SEC championship, they're winning this damn game. If. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they may be up. I don't know. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. I know. I don't know, man. It's, you know, I, I'm always. I'm also curious. Injury reports. We're going to get a couple of those a little closer to the weekend. Right. You know, there's some guys that's 
kind of been held out almost as if they were preparing for this this matchup. So, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, it's going to be amazing uh, how the, the healing that takes place this week, you know, for some, uh, some of these guys. <laughs> Absolutely. They're all getting them shots this weekend, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> all right, buddy. Uh, anything else before we hop off the line? No, just again, uh, wild, wild week. Uh, and, you know, more news we have, we'll, we'll definitely be jumping on. Mike's done several emergency podcasts, you know. I, I don't think we may not be done, you know, especially uh, we, we keep hearing some rumors, you know. But, but I will say, if you're on the YouTube, subscribe. Turn those notifications on. We're going to have some fun Saturday. Uh, it's going to be a wild, wild weekend. And, you know, hey, it's the last SEC matchup potentially. So um, I, I'm looking forward to it and looking forward to hanging out with everybody. Yeah, absolutely, Shane. And, and like you said, I mean, these these emergency podcasts have been going great. So uh, who knows? There, there's going to be guys jumping into the portals. There's going to be crazy hirings getting made. And right as I'm speaking here, real quick, Shane, they just announced the playoff. Georgia, number one, Michigan, number two, Washington, three, Florida State, four, Oregon, five, Ohio State, six, Texas, seven, Alabama, eight, Mizzou, nine, Penn State, ten. I don't think they changed a damn one of these shades since last week. So damn. basically, point being, Alabama at number eight, got to beat Georgia, obviously, to, to get that in that playoff mix. But uh Mm. Real quick, let me get your let me get your thoughts on that real quick before we hang up. Yeah, I, I mean because that's that's going to be the question. Let's say Alabama beats Georgia mm -hmm. by one point. Yeah. Okay. Real close game. What do you put two teams in the, from the SEC in over all those guys? Because you, here you're looking at Oregon. The the, the I guess for me. They're going to be looking at that Ohio State and Michigan. Right. Look how many spots Ohio State dropped after losing that one. Do you drop Georgia all the way down, or do you move Alabama up? You know, it's like, where, what do you think happens if if Alabama beats Georgia barely? I think, Shane, if Alabama wins, yeah, I think you have to put them in. There's There's just no way to not put them in, right? Yeah. So Georgia's hope to stay in the playoff, we need probably two things to happen. We need Florida State to lose mm -hmm. or look really ugly against Louisville. It, you know, even if they look – because Louisville I don't think is very good. They just lost to Kentucky. Yeah. So, But Florida State losing would be key, which I think is very realistic. And I think they need Texas to lose to Oklahoma State. Otherwise, I think Georgia would get left out. Buddy. <laughs> oh, blood in the streets, man. <laughs> yeah, I'll that, tell you, it's that's the mentality you got to have if you're Georgia. This, yeah, there, you there is no other game. Just this yeah. one. You have to win. There's a, we, we, can't, we can't count on backsliding in to this playoff. No, this is it, man. That's why we call it the national championship. <laughs> <laughs> exactly brother well hey i appreciate you as always appreciate each and every one of you for hanging out we'll catch you on the next one all right see you guys go balls.